It is a case that has haunted the public for more than 13 years, and many feared that the Gilgo Beach murders may never be solved. The officer located a body. And it seemed to be wrapped in burlap, which didn't make any sense. The crime scene gets expanded. I'm, I'm called, and chief, we found another set of remains. They find another one, and another one. We were dealing with a serial killer. So they're available, they're vulnerable, and very petite. This killer has a type. Right. Uh, does he want the petite uh, body because he wants to feel more empowered and more in control? I want the world to know like my sister mattered. I want answers. I just want answers. An arrest more than a decade in the making in a serial killer case that's baffled law enforcement and the public. 59-year-old Rex Hewerman pled not guilty. I dropped my phone. I couldn't believe it. So just who is Rex Hewerman? An architect who ran a company called RH Consultants and Associates. Rex, hello. Hi. How are you doing? Good to see you. When a job that should have been routine yeah. suddenly becomes not routine, yeah. I get the phone call. Rex Hewerman is a mystery man. Rex is capable of presenting himself one way to one person, one way to another person. My first memory of Rex was that he was very big, imposing, scary, angry. He was bullied. He was bigger than everyone else. The kids would gang up on him. And Rex was very smart, too. He's a smart person, very smart. He liked to shock people. He was interested in power games. Rex loved hunting, and he loved guns. Going out, shooting, hunting, that was his passion. All petite, all bound in burlap bags. The burlap on the bodies, that points right at a, a hunter. It was DNA collected from a pizza slice he tossed in a Manhattan trash can that came back as a match with hair found on the victims. And that's where we obtained, you know, his full profile from, from the pizza crust left in the box. In terms of speaking to my client, the only thing I can tell you that he did say uh, as he was in tears was, I didn't do this. Everyone's just trying to put the pieces together. I want to know what I missed. I think we all want to know what we missed. Not far from this quiet stretch of Gilgo Beach on Long Island, New York, investigators uncovered the hidden remains of four young women. The mystery of who they were and how they got here might have stayed a secret if not for a woman named Shannon Gilbert. In the early morning hours of May 1st, 2010, 23 year old Shannon, working as an escort, called 911. State police. Yeah, there's somebody after me. The call came from a neighborhood not far from Gilgo Beach. These people are plotting to kill me. Shannon starts running, knocking on doors. Where are you, Shannon? She screams. And then nothing. Shannon was gone. Hello? Hello? Canine searched the area exhaustively for Shannon Gilbert. Dominic Verone was chief of detectives at the Suffolk County Police Department. Months passed without a sign of the missing woman. 
And then in December 2010, near Gilgo Beach, a police officer and his canine named Blue found human remains. Everyone assumed it was Shannon Gilbert. But it wasn't Shannon. Stunned searchers would go on to discover the remains of four other women. The women were identified as Maureen Brainer Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Like Shannon, all were in their 20s. All were online escorts, all petite. Three of the four were wrapped in burlap, the kind you can find in hunting stores. They became known as the Gilgo Four. It's really, really hard because I miss her so much. 48 Hours has reported on this case since 2010. Over the years, we've secured exclusive interviews with the family and friends of the Gilgo Four. Missy Can will never forget the wintry day when she got the devastating news. The detectives came to my house and just said that Maureen has been positively identified as one of the victims on Ocean Parkway. Her sister, Maureen Brainer Barnes, a mother of two, was the first to disappear on July 9th, 2007. She was very smart and very creative. She liked being a mom? She loved being a mom. But life as a single mom living in Norwich, Connecticut was difficult. Missy didn't know it, but Maureen had turned to escort work, and that July went to New York City for a weekend to make money. On her way home, she called Missy from Penn Station in Midtown Manhattan. Attention, please. I could hear the commotions from the train station. From the time that she called me, it was poof, she was gone. She reported Maureen missing. Eventually, officers would tell Missy that after her sister's disappearance, someone had used Maureen's cell phone to make a call from Long Island. It wasn't known then, but those two locations, Long Island and Midtown Manhattan, would become important clues in the hunt for a serial killer. Nearly two years to the day that Maureen vanished, 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew went missing in July of 2009, also from Midtown Manhattan. Lynn Bartholomew is Melissa's mother. How often do you think about Melissa? Every single minute of the day. It just didn't happen to the girls. I mean, it destroyed all of our families. Melissa moved from Buffalo to New York City to work as a hairdresser. At some point, she also began working as an escort and then disappeared. About a week after she went missing, Melissa's then 15-year-old sister, Amanda, started getting calls from Melissa's phone. We agreed not to show Amanda's face. She answers, you know, Melissa, where have you been? And this voice is saying, oh, this isn't Melissa. Stephen Cohen was the family's lawyer at the time. He was taunting Amanda, and he said, do you know what I did to your sister? I killed Melissa. All I can say is he's sick, and he's going to make a mistake, and we're going to catch him. Those calls from Melissa's own phone may very well have been that mistake. When police trace them, the calls place the person they believe to be Melissa's killer in Midtown Manhattan. The following year, Megan Waterman, the mother of a three-year-old girl, disappeared from a hotel on Long Island. Part of you is like missing. It's just like something's always off. We spoke with Megan's daughter, Liliana, in 2020. I would do anything to bring her back, but I can't, and it just, like, frustrates me so bad. Megan's family says the 22-year-old was a creative but troubled young woman who loved fashion and was devoted to her daughter. What would you say to your mom if you could? I would just want to tell her that, like, I love her. I just want her to know that she has a special place in my heart. No one can ever replace her. Like the other two women, Megan disappeared in the summer. On June 6, 2010, 
She was working as an escort on Long Island. No matter what her job was, she was a person and she needs justice. This haunting video from a Holiday Inn Express is the last time she was seen alive, moments before she went to meet a client. Cell phone records later placed her phone in a Long Island neighborhood called Massapequa Park. Amber Costello was the last of the Gilgo Four to disappear. She lived here just seven and a half miles from Massapequa Park. She used to say she was 4'11", but she wasn't. She was like 4'9", you know? I mean, she was small. Amber's friend and former roommate, Dave Schaller, spoke with us in 2011. She was an amazing person, she really was. He says Amber was addicted to drugs and used sex work to support her habit. But as amazing as she was, was as tormented as she was. After Amber disappeared, police say Schaller told them about her clients. He described one of them as looking like an ogre and having a first-generation Chevrolet avalanche. On the night she went missing, Schaller says, a client offered Amber $1,500 for the night, six times her hourly rate. This guy was so relentless. He called several times. He was on the phone with her for quite a while each time. He says the client got Amber, an experienced escort, to do something she never did, leave without her purse or cell phone, and meet him in his car. I walked out the front door with her. She, she gave me a hug. She's like, I love you. And she left. It was nearly midnight. Schaller says that when Amber left this house, she walked down the street and he never saw her again. Schaller told us that he didn't see the client's face that night, but suspects he had seen him before. So this is a guy you might have seen. Yeah, this is somebody that I've seen. I might be the, one of the only people who knows who he is. It would be more than a decade before Schaller's description would lead to a break in the case and a prime suspect. To see a timeline of how the case unfolded, go to 48hours.com. The shocking developments in a murder case gone cold. My coworker called me and she said, did you know what happened to Rex? And I'm like, no. A husband, a father, an architect stood before a judge charged as a serial killer. She says, it's Rex. I said, no way. This house was a main focus, and they brought out a lot of evidence. I just didn't think it was real. A Long Island community is still a crime scene tonight. I even thought to myself, it's crazy that there's two Rex Hermans out there. Mary Shell and Muriel Henriquez worked with Rex Hewerman and couldn't wrap their heads around the news. We never thought he would be that kind of person. It's shocking. In July of 2023, nearly 13 years after the Gilgo Four were discovered, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison made the announcement. Authorities believe Rex Hewerman is the Long Island serial killer. Rex Hewerman is a demon that walks among us, a predator that ruined families. The man he calls a demon is a six foot four architect. He's charged with killing Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, Amber Costello, and is the prime suspect in the death of Maureen Brainerd Barnes. What has my client told me? He told me he didn't do this. Hewerman was living about 20 minutes from Gilgo Beach in Massapequa Park the very same town where Megan's phone last connected with the cell tower. And Hewerman worked here at his architectural firm in Midtown Manhattan, just blocks from where Maureen disappeared, the same area where several of the threatening calls to Melissa's little sister were made. The cause of death with regard to the three victims is homicidal violence. A married man, Hewerman, lived in this rundown house and has a daughter and stepson with his second wife, Asa. Asa, who was born in Iceland, 
would take the children to see her family there in the summers. It was during these trips and others police believe that Hewerman killed the women. You never got any kind of hint no. of another life. No. Totally Muriel Henriquez worked at Hewerman's company, RH Consultants and Associates, and spoke exclusively to 48 Hours. She recalled a gift he gave her in the summer of 2007. This is a sweater. He asked his wife to bring back from a trip to Iceland. Muriel, who says she was touched at the time by Hewerman's thoughtful gesture, now wonders if his wife's absence that summer gave him an opportunity to kill Maureen Brainerd Barnes, who disappeared on July 9, 2007. How do you feel about this sweater now? No, I'm definitely not gonna wear this sweater now. Still, she says she saw nothing alarming about the Rex Hewerman she saw daily. A little bit of a nerd in a way. He liked to talk about himself, what he knew. I mean, not a narcissist, but a little bit of a, you know, I know everything kind of guy. Pompous. Pompous. She remembers him running to and from job sites, eating fast food on the run. Pizza. That was his number one thing. Police say they found nearly 300 guns in a basement vault. When she heard that police had recovered almost 300 firearms from a vault in Hewerman's basement, she was surprised only by the number. She knew him as an avid hunter. Going out, shooting, hunting, that was his passion. What was it about hunting he liked? I don't know. I guess he liked the idea of having a prize. Stalking so, prey? Stalking prey and winning. He liked to win. And while she says it never occurred to her that Hewerman could be dangerous, she does remember a time when his tracking skills unnerved her. It was her 40th birthday, and she had booked a cruise vacation. Where are you going? He said, I'm going you know, to be in the middle of the ocean. You're not going to find me in the middle of the ocean. He said, oh, yes, I can. Muriel didn't think much of the comment until the second day of her trip. There was a white envelope under my door. It was a note from him. The note said, I told you I could find you anywhere. He had photos from hunting trips. Mary Shell worked with Hewerman in the summer of 2010. It was the same summer that both Amber Costello and Megan Waterman vanished. He would talk about, you know, the meat in particular that bear meat could keep in the freezer for months. Hearing authorities now say that some of the victims were wrapped in a burlap that hunters often use was chilling. The burlap really got to me. Since Hewerman's arrest, Mary has written about her experience with him. She's also talked to other former female employees who said they weren't always treated with respect. He would have one of them uh, clean the toilet if he thought the cleaning person hadn't done a good enough job. A woman in the office? Yes. He more than once commented on women's bodies. If someone perhaps had gained some weight, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. John Parisi grew up with Hewerman. He says Hewerman was bullied as a child. I remember meeting Rex when I was in first or second grade. He was a loner, not many friends. The children were super mean to him, made fun of him and teased him. But John says he never saw Hewerman fight back. He was big enough that if he got upset and started swinging, he would hurt somebody. But he never did. As Hewerman got older, John points out, things didn't get much better. It was rejected by many girls. We all go through that awkward stage growing up, and it seemed like that awkward stage stayed with him longer than usual. Still, he says many in the community find it hard to believe that Hewerman is the notorious serial killer, living a double life for more than a decade. People were saying, oh my God, I can't believe we have a serial killer in our town and we grew up with and we walked amongst the killer. Another classmate of Hewerman's, actor Billy Baldwin, took to social media when the news broke, tweeting, it was mind boggling. 
Rex! Hello! Hi. How are you doing? The awkward Long Island teenager grew up to be a confident and seemingly successful architect. Antoine Amira met and interviewed him in 2022. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been right. working in Manhattan since 1987. There's nothing in my interview that made me think that this person in front of me uh, is a dangerous person. Antoine is a hotel food and beverage manager in New York who loves real estate. He has a YouTube interview show where he handpicks guests whom he thinks are interesting and accomplished. I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Antoine says Huberman was well known for his skill at helping companies and individuals get building permits. When a job that should have been routine yeah. suddenly becomes not routine, yeah. I get the phone call. Gotcha. Correct. What really I mean, stood out for me was he was very, very, very smart. And known, says Antoine, for his ability to find loopholes in the rules. He was pleased when he was doing it. That he could... That he, that he out could outwit the, the system. That's it, folks. That was Rex. But Antoine says he remembers it was hard to get Hewerman to crack a smile. It's selfie time. Selfie time. Not even during the signature sunglasses selfies he takes with three, every guest. One, two, three. Ah! Can you smile? That is. If police are right, Rex Hurman was able to hide a life as a serial killer. And if he did, his habit of eating pizza on the go would turn out to be his undoing. For more than a decade after the discovery of the Gilgo Four, Rex Huerman's name never appeared on a suspect list until a new task force was formed with Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison and Suffolk County DA Ray Tierney. In February of 2022, we formed the task force and then a mere six weeks later, Rex Huerman was identified for the first time. A suspect in six weeks? So how did they do it? It turns out that buried in the original case files were a number of critical clues that the new task force was finally able to connect. Remember Amber's roommate, Dave Schaller? She's like, I love you. You know, she gave me a hug and she left. He had told police about one of Amber's clients and his vehicle. Just a large, built man, and that he was driving this, this first-generation Chevy Avalanche. A first-generation Chevy Avalanche with a description of an ogre-like man and the make and model of his truck. Police took a closer look at Amber's phone records from 2010. Schaller had told them that before Amber disappeared, there was one particular client calling incessantly. He called several times. He was on the phone with her for quite a while each time. Police back then knew the client was using a burner phone. That's a prepaid phone that anyone can buy and use anonymously. And they knew that Maureen, Melissa, and Megan had all been in contact with burner numbers right before they disappeared. In 2012, with the help of the FBI, they determined that most of those calls connected to cell towers inside a small area of Massapequa Park. They called it the box. So how large an area is that box? It's, you know, a couple of blocks within, within Massapequa Park. The new task force began the search for a large-built man who also lived in that small area and owned a Chevy Avalanche at the time of the disappearances. Was there a aha moment when all of a sudden his name came up? Once we were able to t attach the Avalanche inside of that Massapequa box, which then attached to Rex Huerman, that was a moment where we said, okay, 
There's something here. The task force now had a prime suspect, and when they looked at Huerman's personal cell phone records, they found that his phone was in the same area as those burner phones when they were used to contact a victim in Massapequa Park or in Midtown Manhattan. It was always consistent. Tierney says this was also true for those awful calls Melissa's family got from that man using her phone back in 2009. He said, do you know what I did to your sister? And he said, well, I killed Melissa. The task force says that it confirmed that Huerman does in fact use burner phones. Investigators say he had two different burner numbers in 2022, and they say they watched him put money on one of those accounts here. And according to court papers, the team also documented three email accounts using fake names, including John Springfield, Thomas Hawk, and Hunter1903, and all linked to those burner numbers. And prosecutors say that Huerman was using a burner phone to send these selfies to solicit and arrange for sexual activity. One of those accounts linked to Huerman, prosecutors wrote, was used to conduct, quote, thousands of searches related to sex workers, sadistic torture-related pornography, and child pornography. There was a lot of uh, torture, uh, porn, and depictions of women uh, being abused, uh, being raped, and being killed. Investigators also say that while they were busy watching Huerman, Huerman was trying to watch them, conducting searches on the task force and the Gilgo victims. Not only pictures of the victims, pictures of their relatives, their, their, their sisters, their children, uh, and he was trying to locate those individuals. The circumstantial evidence was building, but investigators also had physical evidence from the Gilgo Four, including one male hair that was found in the burlap used to, quote, restrain and transport Megan Waterman's body. And they wanted to see if they could link it to Huerman. Police tailed Huerman, and when he threw out this pizza box in this trash can here in Midtown Manhattan, they pounced. The pizza, which was, uh, you know, obviously very significant. Tierney says that Huerman's DNA that was found on that pizza crust was consistent with a DNA profile from the hair found with Megan Waterman's body. And that DNA profile is only found in 0.04% of the population. That was a remarkable day. It was, you know, the weekend, and you know, you read, you get the report, and you read it, and then you read it again, and then you read it a third time, and then you read it a fourth time, uh, and then you start making calls. With the DNA, the search histories, and the burner phone evidence, the team felt it was time. When we decided to take down the case, we, you know, it was a sudden decision. We did see him contacting a number of sex workers using a burner phone, which obviously is concerning. Playing clothes officers arrested him around the corner from his office. I don't think he had any clue. I don't think he had any clue that we were on to him. Police spent 12 days looking through Huerman's home, pulling those guns out of the basement and digging in the backyard. They say it will take some time to comb through what they have now, and they were tight-lipped about what they found. Has the search been fruitful? Great question and answer is yes. Can you elaborate on fruitful? You said yes. There have been items that we have taken into our possession. That makes it fruitful. And one more big piece of evidence taken into possession, a first-generation Chevy Avalanche Hewerman once used. And it was sitting on property he owns in South Carolina when they recovered it. We were able to seize that Chevy Avalanche pursuant to a search warrant, and we're certainly going to analyze that. But there were female hairs found on some of the victims' bodies that don't belong to the victims. So who do they belong to?
What do you make of the evidence against Rex Huerman? Join the conversation now on social media. After Rex Huerman's arrest, his quiet neighborhood in Massapequa Park was overrun by investigators and media, focusing intense scrutiny on the ramshackle home and its remaining residents, his stepson, Christopher Sheridan, daughter, Victoria Huerman, and his wife of more than 25 years, Asa Ellerup. Their life going forward is always going to be the wife or the children of suspected serial killer. That's what it's going to be from now on. Attorney Bob Macedonio represents Asa Ellerup, who has since filed for divorce from Huerman. He says she was as stunned as anyone by the accusations. She had no idea how this was going on. The allegations are shocking. Nobody wants to think that they've been living with and sleeping next to a serial killer for the past 25 years. As it turns out, Asa may have inadvertently helped focus the investigation on her husband. Investigators say they've identified strands of female hair that were found on two of the victims. One hair on Waterman comes back to his wife, uh, or the DNA profiles are consistent, and then the DNA profile from Costello is consistent with the wife. Although prosecutors have evidence that Asa was out of town when those murders occurred, they will have to explain how those hairs got on the victims. Suffolk County DA Ray Tierney says it could be as simple as transfer. You live at home with a spouse, uh, a little bit of your hair falls on your shoulder as well as uh, your spouse's. Then you go out and you interact with a third party and that hair gets on them. Asa Ellerup has not been charged or named a suspect in any of the murders. You don't believe that Rex Huerman's wife was involved in this in any way. There's no evidence to indicate that, no. Along with the public scrutiny of Asa, there's also been support from people that perhaps know all too well what she's going through. Carrie Rawson, the daughter of serial killer Dennis Rader, who named himself BTK, tweeted, Asa and her kids are also victims. I can tell that they are going through hell. And from Melissa Moore, the daughter of Keith Jesperson, a serial killer known as the Happy Face Killer, for taunting authorities with letters signed with a happy face. She reached out immediately to myself, and we put her in contact with Asa. At a press conference, Macedonio announced Moore set up a GoFundMe page for Asa, which raised over $50,000. Money, he says, will largely go to medical bills. Asa is battling breast and skin cancer. And because Rex Huerman was the sole provider for the family, Macedonio says she will soon lose her health insurance. Asa would like me to express her thanks for the support she's received. Um, she's going through a very difficult time. Asa's children have also paid a heavy price. Her daughter, Victoria, who worked for her father at the architectural consulting firm, and her son, Christopher, are both now unemployed. Asa struggles to support them, says Macedonio, while she's also trying to figure out how to start over. How is she getting through every day? Honestly? Yeah. Minute by minute. She has uh, no one else to turn to at this time. Family and friends have been hesitant to have her come over because they don't want the media attention. She gets followed wherever she goes. For the moment, she and her children continue to live in the house in Massapequa Park, which the family says was excessively damaged during the police search, seen in these photos provided by Asa's attorney. It's a daily reminder of the unimaginable crimes her estranged husband is charged with and the investigation that continues into what else he may have done. Rex Huerman, awaiting trial, is locked inside a Suffolk County jail in a 60-square-foot cell. He denies killing Melissa Bartholomew, 
Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Their voice is now silent as the sand where they have been ruthlessly discarded. How sure are you, as you're sitting here now, that Rex Dewerman is the Long Island serial killer? So we're just at the beginning stages of this case, but we would not have brought this indictment if we weren't confident in our case. He took away somebody's mother, somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, and not just one person, multiple individuals. Hewerman is currently the prime suspect for the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes. And for investigators, an obvious question still hangs heavy. If Hewerman is a killer, are there other victims? I mean, isn't there a real concern that there may be other victims out there? Always. Who's to say that there's not more bodies out there that we need to investigate? In 2011, police did find other bodies along Ocean Parkway. After finding the Gilgo Four, there is victim number five, Jessica Taylor, an escort who went missing in 2003. Another set of remains, police called Jane Doe number six, is now identified as Valerie Mack, also working as an escort. Number seven, to investigators' surprise, they found a toddler girl. Number eight, an Asian male dressed in women's clothing. Number nine, a female skull belonging to Karen Vergata, an escort who disappeared in 1996. Number 10, female remains from a victim cops nicknamed Peaches because of a tattoo on her torso. Although her remains were found six miles away, police say DNA confirms Peaches is the mother of that toddler. None of those victims has been linked to Hewerman. Is it that you can't connect him yet or you believe he probably isn't the person who killed these other, other individuals? I don't know. Investigations also spread to Las Vegas and South Carolina, where Hewerman owns property, with detectives there taking a fresh look at cases of missing women. And then there's Nikki Brass. I remembered him because, one, he's massive. And how many massive, like, six-foot-five architects work in Manhattan and live in Massapequa? You're going from brown and blonde. Now a hairdresser, Nikki claims she may be one that got away. She told us she used to work as an escort. And while we cannot substantiate her story, Nikki claims she can't shake her memory of the night she says she was solicited for sex by Rex Huerman and says she fled the restaurant where they met. I had never gone anywhere and like felt fear. My gut was telling me I needed to get away, and I've never had that before. Nikki says what she found most disturbing is that Hewerman himself brought up those bodies bound in burlap by Gilgo Beach. He wanted to, like, really get into it. Like, he asked me how I thought they could get rid of the bodies without being caught in that area. And I said, I've never been over there. I've never even seen Gilgo Beach. And his response was, well, it's really dark and desolate. I'm John Ray, and I'm the lawyer. Nikki is now so represented by John Ray, an attorney who is also representing Shannon Gilbert's family. In December of 2011, investigators finally found Shannon here in the marsh, not far from Gilgo Beach but they don't believe she was murdered. It's an unfortunate incident, but right now we believe that she just ran into the marsh and unfortunately drowned. A former investigator told us that he believes Shannon was high on drugs that night and says her death was an accident, something John Ray just can't believe. While he doesn't think Shannon was a victim of Hewerman, he does believe she was murdered and points to that 911 call. <laughs> 
it absolutely makes no sense that she's found where she is, except that someone else put her there or killed her there. While questions remain about Shannon's last hours, there's no question she's the reason so many families may finally be getting answers they have long waited for. We spoke to her sister, Cherie, in 2011. If my sister, you know, didn't make that 911 call, I don't think that these other women would have been recovered either. Now investigators hope that with an arrest, they can give the victims' families who stood with them a sense of justice and of peace. I've gotten to know the families and I'm inspired by them and I'm impressed by their patience. A local legend has it that this place, Gilgo Beach, was named for a skilled fisherman called Gil. These silver gray waters once his secret hunting ground. Today, this beach area is better known for a relentless hunter of human prey, a serial killer whose chilling presence can still be felt in the ocean air. Four students connected by friendship, then by tragedy. Zana's family speaks for the first time. She just was always fun. She was uplifting. Kaylee's parents believe the killer was there before. He had to know when people were coming, people were going. 48 Hours, next on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Personally, I could sort of relate to Kathy Blair and just thinking about what that would be like as a woman to be home alone. That is the boogeyman story for every woman, it's right? It's awful. An intruder is in your house. Yeah. Someone is stabbing you. What's happening? He's my mom is dead. He's still my mom. This is a case that sticks with you throughout your life. My name is Derek Israel. I was working in the homicide unit when this case uh, occurred. Uh, my name is Carrie Scanlon, and I was the lead investigator on the Kathy Blair murder. Kathy was a larger than life. She's my big sister. I uh, have always thought everything Kathy did was amazing. How would you describe her from a student's perspective? She was so kind, um, just believed in me wholeheartedly. It still makes no sense. Who kills a choir director? Who does that? She's a monster. Uh, I get notified that there's been another murder. The victims are an elderly couple. They were the best parents you could ever want. They were just sweet people, like anybody's grandmother and grandfather. Right from the get-go, it started sounding really familiar. It's so violent, and it's eerily similar to Kathy Blair's. And when we saw the connection, we just continued to work the investigations together. You know, Carrie and I both kind of came to the conclusion that there was a serial killer working here in Austin. I was uh, out testing a thermal scope. I needed to get some video of some deer. Rob Leaf has this thermal imaging scope. It's a night vision rifle scope. So I saw the car pull up and park. I zoomed in with the scope, and by the time I had zoomed in, someone had gotten out, walked over to the sidewalk. That is just unbelievably chilling. The last thing they were expecting was high-resolution thermal video. This video showed the murderer walking towards Kathy Blair's house. The actual killer? The actual killer.
days in Texas, it seems like all roads lead to Austin. The sleek skyline of the Lone Star capital glittering. A boomtown that welcomes newcomers chasing dreams. It's a city charged with life, an unlikely place to find tragedy as dark as the death of a dreamer like Kathy Blair. She loved life. You loved being around her. What were the things that were important to her? She had, I think, a sense of justice, right and wrong. Kirsten Matheson is Kathy's younger sister. Um, she was bossy. <laughs> and even as kids in California, it was clear Kathy had a passion. She was always singing. She had a God-given talent, which was her voice. It was music that led Kathy to Austin. Kathy went to UT Austin to get her master's degree in vocal performance. She loved Austin. But love didn't always work out for Kathy. She divorced twice. Still, her affair with Austin held firm. And by 2013, Kathy was renting a house on a quiet street here on Tamarack Trail. It was home. She loved the people here. She loved the vibe. In a city known around the world for music, Kathy Blair fit right in. She had melody and rhythm in her soul. But you wouldn't find her singing the blues here on Austin's famed 6th Street. Instead, she chose a more spiritual stage for her talents. Christian Choral Society was a positive social setting. The kids were kind to each other. Barbara Sally's daughter was one of hundreds of students touched by Kathy's talent as a choir director and teacher. I think she lived, breathed, ate, slept music. Barbara, she, along with Kathy's student, Kristen DeGroot, met with us to share their memories of Kathy. She was so kind, um, just believed in me wholeheartedly, which uh, was something I really needed. And for Kristen, Kathy was a role model. She and I were the same. Music needed to be in our lives or we would die. She was their teacher and their mentor. One of her friends called it the Kathy Nation. <laughs> the Kathy Nation? The Kathy Nation. <laughs> it was December 6, 2014. Kathy's son Joe was staying with her while waiting for his assignment from the Navy. After a night out, he came home to Tamarack Trail. What he found was shattering and echoed across that Kathy Nation. I think my mom is dead. There's a lot of blood. I think someone broke in. I think my mom. Joe, what's your mom's name? Her name is Kathy Blair. This case was clearly different, really, right from the right from the get-go. Starting with the location. Oh, this is a nice neighborhood. This is a place where people, I think, feel safe. Up until this case, which would frighten and chill Austin and shock veteran detectives Scanlon and Israel. One of the first things I thought of, I'm like, well, why, why this, this house? Yeah, why this house? There's nothing that uh, makes this house stand out from all the other ones. This is the living room right here. Then in Kathy Blair's bedroom. There's a full-size jewelry case right here, mm -hmm. large drawers. All the drawers have been pulled out and they're stacked up. So it's like someone dumped them out and then put them in a pile right here. Someone who had time to do that. Correct. A jewel thief who had time. Because Kathy Blair was already dead. This murder started right here on the bed. 53-year-old Kathy Blair lay alone, asleep in her own bed. She awoke to the ultimate nightmare. Yeah, Kathy Blair fought like hell. Choked, stabbed, and finally slashed across the neck. The wound is a fatal wound, but she still has time, you know, to put up that fight. She, she, she fought for her life. Kathy's here, and there's blood all around her. So much blood that it formed the timeline of a murder. 
there's a light switch. And on mm -hmm. that light switch, we saw blood, like a, a, a blood swipe. That told us that the perpetrator had come in here after the murder and, and switched that light on. There are more blood swipes on these drawers. And that tells me the murder of Kathy Blair occurs before these drawers were removed. Word soon spread across Austin and across Kathy Nation. I just said, no, that's not what happened. That cannot possibly be what happened. Was Kathy Blair the kind of woman who might have an enemy who would do that? No. She and didn't have a malicious bone in her body. Why does someone come in here and, and murder someone in order to steal a little bit of jewelry? Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't make sense. It would be the first in a hideous series of senseless events. It's just one of those moments where you're in disbelief. You think you're living in a dream. This does not happen. But it did happen, and the killer left almost no evidence, no DNA. No fingerprints. No fingerprints. And no blood from the killer. No. Israel and Scanlon would need all their street smarts and then some because just nine days later... I get notified that there's been another murderer. Austin detectives Israel and Scanlon, images of Kathy Blair's death were harrowing. Attacked in the middle of the night, and it was a really horrific scene. But there was no physical evidence from a killer who made virtually no mistakes, and that meant there was no clear suspect. Then suddenly, the search for a suspect changed in a way no one could imagine. It was around 1.30 a.m. on the night that Kathy Blair died. And one of her neighbors was out for a late night walk. What he saw and what he did would give the detectives their first big break in the case. I was out testing a thermal scope. I needed to get some video of some deer. And we've got some deer up and down the street. Rob Leaf lived a few short blocks from Kathy Blair. So it's a thermal scope, so it picks up a heat signature. Wow, it's like daytime. Except it was the dead of night, and Rob was only looking for deer. I saw the headlights of a car coming up. I saw the car pull up and park, and- On uh, this street? On this street. Rob kept recording. This is video he recorded that night with a scope like this one. I zoomed in with the scope, and by the time I had zoomed in, someone had gotten out and walked over to the sidewalk. You can flip the setting to red to see the image more clearly. Did you focus in on the car? Uh, I first focused in on the person, and it turns okay. left on Tamarack. Kathy Blair's street. The next day, Rob flew to Las Vegas on a planned trip with old friends. Reading the news on my phone and saw a murder story. I clicked on it, and I saw the address. Rob raced back to Austin. He checked the video of that stranger on his street. And I called Austin police. And how important does the video end up being in Kathy Blair's case? Very, very yeah. important. The video was tantalizing, but blank on images that did not give off heat. So you couldn't actually identify the man, a license plate number, or even if there was anyone else inside the vehicle. Still, there was one important clue. It gave us an idea of what kind of vehicle our murder suspect arrived at the crime scene with, and it was a sedan of some sort. These cops needed much more evidence. Then, nine days after Kathy Blair's murder, in another peaceful Austin neighborhood just 15 minutes from Kathy's home, they would get it. The victims are an elderly couple murdered overnight. Viciously. Viciously. Sydney Jr., Johnny, and Brenda want their parents to be remembered as the outstanding people they were, not the grim headlines they became. Billy and Sydney Shelton were hardworking and happily married for 64 years. We were never rich, but not once did Daddy ever complain about it. Not once did Mama ever complain about it. 
a life well lived and peacefully slowing down. Billy was 83, her husband Sydney, 85. We days are sweet. People that, you know, send you on your way with some cookies. Home nurse Dow Catrola was making her scheduled visit on December 15th, 2014. I knocked, nobody answered. Front door was splintered. It, it was clearly had been busted open. Dow nervously headed to the Shelton's modest bedroom. And their room had been ransacked. And then to the left, I saw him on the bed mm -hmm. and I, I ran. I just turned around and I ran. Sydney and Billy Shelton had been beaten and stabbed. The knife is still present yes. in one of the victims. That's correct. Is it clear that it's also a burglary? Yeah, I was seeing some of the same things. The same things found at Kathy Blair's murder scene, starting with an empty jewelry box. And again, the drawers were pulled out, they had been emptied and stacked. Three people had been slaughtered in their own beds. The crime scenes were eerily similar, and investigators were privately wondering, was there a serial killer loose on the streets of Austin? If word gets out that there's a serial killer, it kicks it to an entirely different level. So investigators kept their worst fears to themselves. But why would any killer target Kathy or Billy and Sydney, who cops determined didn't even know each other? None of these people had any enemies that we could figure out. What is it that connects these people together besides the killer? Every lead was chased down. Then, almost three weeks after Kathy was killed, the name of a stranger surfaced. Tim Parlin. He'd done yard work at Kathy's house, and a friend reported Parlin was weird and rude. I go to our computer system. It was a simple and easy search. Tim Parlin had spent decades in prison. And he stole jewelry. And he stole jewelry. Specifically jewelry. Mm -hmm. At night. Are you hopeful at this point? Yeah, I am. So this is the in town suites. Tim Parlin, where he was living at the time the murders happened. Israel and Scanlon went to look up the lifelong convict. The detectives snapped these photos of Tim Parlin. We told him we're homicide detectives. So he asked us a few questions as well. About the murder? Well, yeah. Like, so how'd she die? Wow, you know, that's bold. You know, stuff like that. He's sussing it out to see what we know. Like cat and mouse. It is. Parlin spoke to the cops in the hotel's parking lot, but when they asked to see his room, he refused, claiming his wife was inside and asleep. And you drive away, and what's the conversation? I said, this is our guy. You did? Yeah, and Derek says, I don't know yet. A return trip to the in-town suites just a few days later pays off. Parlin wasn't home but his wife was. Explain what we were investigating, and she knew the Sheltons. His wife knew the Sheltons. Tim Parlin's wife knew the Sheltons from church, and Tim Parlin had worked in Kathy Blair's yard. It was tenuous, but it was a connection. She gave us permission to search the apartment. Did you find anything? We did, a pawn receipt. This is that pawn receipt. For a piece of jewelry, a, a nugget pendant. And it turns out that pendant belonged to Kathy Blair. It was pawned on the same night that Kathy Blair was murdered. We found out that his sister had a green Toyota. Harlan had been using his sister's car, a green Toyota. Its outline appeared similar to the car in Rob Leaf's video. And one caught on security footage approaching that Austin pawn shop less than 24 hours after Kathy was murdered. We took it. We had it towed. Towed and tested. On the passenger seat, traces of dried blood. Blood belonged to Kathy Blair that was in that car. Austin was on edge. Kathy Blair was found dead inside her home. Hoping for an arrest. The wait for justice has been troubling for her students, family, and friends. My name is Hema Muller, and I'm an anchor at CBS Austin News. It was very, very shocking in the community, and it was really unsettling. But now justice was closing in on one man, Tim Parlin. But you're thinking one guy still. Oh, yeah. Do you believe Rob Leaf's video can help ID Kathy Blair's killer?
See more of what Leaf captured that night on Facebook at 48 Hours. When Kathy Blair's blood was found in Tim Parlin's car, detectives Israel and Scanlon were convinced that he had killed her. At that point, we're all jubilant. We're super excited. We got our guy. Parlin fit the bill perfectly. He had done yard work for Kathy Blair and was a career criminal with a long rap sheet of burglaries. Now I just need to question him, confront him. Hopefully he'll confess, but if he doesn't, we have hard physical evidence to tie this guy to the murder. Israel had Parlin arrested for an unrelated parole violation and brought in for questioning. It seemed like a pretty short and straight road to charging Tim Parlin with murder. It turned out it wasn't a short road and it certainly wasn't a straight road. The first step was to get Parlin to corroborate some of the details of Kathy's murder. I just straight up told him that, you know, we knew that he had killed uh, Kathy Blair. What's his response? I didn't do it. And this was the thing he really liked to say. These hands didn't kill anyone. So the detectives asked him who did, but Parlin wasn't giving up that information so easily. So after hours of this conversation, he finally says, okay, I'll tell you who it was. And that's when he said, Sean Gant Ben Alcazar. Who is that? That's what I said. Who is that? Did you think he was stalling? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This sounded completely made up. And I knew as soon as he said it that he had screwed us. Because now he had to Because now we got to go hunt some mystery guy down and prove that he didn't commit a murder. With their lead suspect behind bars for now, the detectives reluctantly contacted Parlin's mystery man. Sean Gant Benelcazar had never been in trouble with the law. He had a degree in microbiology was once a high school science teacher and seemed an unlikely acquaintance of a serial jewel thief. This guy lived in Galveston. He didn't cause any trouble. Gamp and Elkazar readily agreed to meet with them that night at the Galveston Police Department. Because you're in Galveston, all right, we're investigating a murder in Austin. And in particular, we're looking at Tim Parlin as the person that we the murder. I'm completely in the dark on this. Um, who was murdered? He tells the detectives he barely knows Parlin, that he just met him a few months earlier when his sister began dating Parlin's nephew. So we started talking, okay, well, when's the last time you were in Austin? Well, I've been in Austin a few times for the last month. He was in town during the, the weekends of both of those murders. And on top of it, he was staying with Tim Parlin. The thing is, honestly, I want to help you guys out because this guy, wolf in sheep's clothing, basically, didn't tell me anything about his, his past. And I'm starting to feel like he set me up like a patsy or something. The detectives knew from Parlin's criminal record that he did have a history of being a master manipulator. Did Tim ever approach you about doing burglaries? And before long, the mystery man who initially said he knew nothing slowly started to crack. Gant Benelcazar now says he was sitting in the car when Parlin went into Kathy Blair's house. So where are you sitting in the car, passenger seat? Well, if he's sitting in the passenger seat, then why is there blood in the passenger seat? But Gant Benelcazar had an explanation. He says Parlin came back to the car clutching a bloody pillowcase. Came back with a sack, had blood on it, threw it in the passenger floorboard, and I took a peek at it, it had jewelry in it, and I didn't want anything to do with it. When did you figure out that it had something to do with the murder? The fact that it had blood on it was not a good sign. Then, about four hours into the interview, no, I'm just wondering, the restaurant. as he walked down a hallway, and he was walking in front of me, I looked up, and it just, I mean, I got a chill because I was like, that's the same walk as the guy in the video. Remember that spooky thermal video that the cops think accidentally caught Kathy Blair's killer ambling down the sidewalk? It, you know, it's just the broadness, the deliberate steps. 
I thought it was him. I definitely believed it could be him. Was it actually Gamp Benalcazar and not Parland who had gone into Kathy's house? We started pursuing, you know, the line of questioning along the lines of maybe he was in the house. Did he bully you into going into the house? Or I was scared, and you know, he he was taking a threatening tone. He told me to go in the house and get the stuff. And finally, he admitted I did go into the house, and I did steal the jewelry. Came in through where? The back door, you said? Yeah, it was open. Okay. Open, unlocked, unlocked. Yeah. I looked around and kind of prowled and snuck through quietly. I turned on a couple lights um, in rooms where I didn't see her. I found the room where she was and she was fast asleep. And that was the room her jewelry box was in. Okay. And so I, I opened the jewelry box, took the stuff out, put it in the, the thing. Maybe he went back, I don't know, okay. but I didn't kill her. Yeah, I told him that's, that's impossible. Everything you said is true, except that it's not possible she was still alive when you left. And I explained that the person who turned on those light switches you talked about turning on, the person who removed that pillowcase you talked about removing, the person who removed those drawers you talked about removing, that person had Kathy Blair's blood on his hands. So the person who did all that killed Kathy Blair. I kept pushing him for the reason. Something happened in that room when you were there. What happened? And that's when he said, I was standing there, I was looking at her. With no room left to lie, he breaks down. She woke up, she lunged at me, grabbed the knife, started trying to wrestle it out of my hand. And then it was a struggle and I, stabbed her in the neck. The confession came unexpectedly. The witness was now the prime suspect. We had gone to clear the guy, and instead he confessed to capital murder. Gamp and Alcazar kept talking and claimed that after murdering Kathy Blair, he handed off her jewelry to Parlin. You didn't get to keep any of it? No, he didn't give me anything. I got nothing. You're going to have to ask him where he fenced it. Sean Gamp and Elkazar appears to have gained absolutely nothing from this senseless murder. I've never met anyone who would go into someone's house and sneak in at night and, and murder them in their bed. For what reason? None. For their own gratification. That's it. We're going to place you under arrest for capital murder. Detectives immediately read Gant Benalcazar his rights, but they still wanted to learn what he knew about the murder of the Sheltons. We started talking again, asking him about the Sheltons. Try as they might, Gant Benalcazar wasn't talking anymore. Well, I wasn't there for that one. I don't know anything about that one. By this point, everyone is exhausted, so eventually he just he terminated the interview. He said, I'm done. Done. <laughs> Wish this all had never happened. After the arrest, Detective Scanlon made this video of Gant Benalcazar on his cell phone. His hunch seemed right. That's the moment that you think it's that, yeah. him. That's when I thought it was him. Two men are in jail in connection with the murder of a beloved choir teacher. Four days later, Austin police announced that they had made two arrests. 30-year-old Sean Gant Benalcazar of Galveston is charged with capital murder. 49-year-old Timothy Parlin is also expected to face charges related to Blair's murder. Sean Gant Benalcazar, he was a UT graduate. He had no criminal record of any kind. How did he get involved with a crime like this? Tim Parlin had an answer. Later, while in custody, Parlin admitted to the cops that he had driven Gamp and Alcazar to Kathy Blair's house and to the Shelton residence on the nights they were murdered. And Parlin says he knew all along that Gamp and Alcazar had killed all three of them. Investigators now thought they understood what had happened. Sean murdered the Sheltons. Uh, Tim Parlin was a party to that murder. Mm -hmm. and he planned it. He facilitated it. He profited from it. He assisted in it. But you are 100% convinced that it was Sean who murdered that couple? Yes. Will he ever be brought to trial for it? It seems unlikely. Unlikely because there was no direct evidence linking Gamp and Alcazar to the Shelton murders. And he would always deny he had killed them. 
prosecutors would focus instead on building their strongest case, using Gamp and Alcazar's confession to convict him of killing Kathy Blair. But when Sean Gamp and Alcazar finally gets his day in court, no one could have anticipated what would happen next. Makes you worry because this guy cannot be out on the streets. start the trial in the state of Texas versus Sean Gant Ben Alcazar this morning. Three years after Sean Gant Ben Alcazar confessed to the murder of Kathy Blair, his trial begins. Did then and there intentionally commit murder by causing the death? You never know what a jury's going to do, mm -hmm. but it was a very, very strong case. You're all here today. Assistant DA's Andrea Austin and David Levingston present the state's case. The man who sits among us in this courtroom the defendant, Sean Gant and Alcazar, is Kathy Blair's killer. Um, How hard was it to be there during that trial? It was really hard. There were some pictures throughout that, that I saw that I can't unsee. Mm -hmm. There was a car that, that parked while I was out on the walk. Kathy's neighbor, Rob Leaf, testifies about the video he recorded on the night she was murdered. Mm -hmm. By the time I zoomed and zoomed back in, someone was already out of the car and was crossing onto the sidewalk. That someone, the prosecutor tells the jury, was Sean Gamp and Alcazar on his way to murder Kathy Blair. I just kind of looked through the rooms, you know, and I, I turned on a couple lights um, in rooms where I didn't see her. The prosecution's case hinges on Gamp and Alcazar's rambling five-hour confession where he describes breaking into Kathy's house. She woke up, she lunged at me. He had a knife out. They fought over the knife. And I stabbed her in the neck. He didn't just kind of confess. He straight up confessed to all the details of, of killing Kathy Blair. Signed David. That confession was vital to the prosecution's case. He gave enough details in this confession that were kept out of the media so we could show the confession was from the actual killer and that he knew enough about this crime to have either been there or done it himself. There is no question that this is a horrible, horrible crime. But Gamp and Alcazar's defense lawyer, Ariel Payan, makes a bold accusation right off the top. That damning video? She just was trying to fight the knife away from me, and I was... It was all a lie, a false confession coerced by detectives Israel and Scanlon. No, I'm just wondering... The defense tells the jury that during that five-minute bathroom break in the hallway, when Gant Benelkazar was not being recorded, detectives threatened him. Law enforcement went down there. We believe the evidence will show with the express idea, plan, purpose, and intent to try to get him to confess to something he didn't do. They have to come up with something. They have to argue that it's an involuntary statement, but it, we obviously knew that wasn't true. The exact words were, this is important and we're not, you're not going anywhere until we finish. Gamp and Alcazar takes the stand to blame the cops for his confession. That if I, I didn't explain a reason for having done it, even though I didn't do it, um, I would get the death penalty. And he maintains that it was actually Tim Parlin who killed Kathy Blair on that chilly December evening back in 2014. Were you worried the jury might you believe You always it? have to worry with juries. You don't get blood on your hands and put it on a jewelry chest. At closing arguments, prosecutors insist Gap and Alcazar voluntarily confessed and offered details about the crime only the killer could have known. I think it comes down to credibility. Mm -hmm. right? And hopefully are sitting there thinking, this guy confessed, why are we here? The case goes to the jury. When the hours started oh. ticking away, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you feel, you feel awful. Were you worried? Yes. The idea 
that he would get out is just unthinkable. I mean, Sean is going to kill somebody else if he got out. After 19 hours of jury deliberations, this time I'll declare a mistrial. A mistrial. The jury cannot reach a verdict. If one person held out, she didn't want to consider the confession. I mean, look, that's what the system is about. We were required to get a unanimous verdict. We didn't get a unanimous verdict. How hard was it to hear that there was a mistrial and you would have to go through it all over again? Really hard. Yeah, that was, that was tough. With a retrial in the works and Tim Parlin's trial less than a month away, prosecutors were worried. Could they get any jury to convict either of these men? Good morning. This man, Timothy Carlin, knew that Sean Gant would go in and murder Kathy Blair. With Sean Gant and Elkazar's mistrial still fresh in her mind, prosecutor Andrea Austin is determined to put Tim Parlin away for life. He stands trial for both the murders of Kathy Blair and the Sheltons. In Texas, if you were part of the crime, then you were also guilty of that crime. You can convict him even if you don't believe he stepped foot inside that house. Because he was there and he participated. Correct. Right. I'm going to ask you to find him guilty of capital murder. Detectives were convinced Gant Vanelkazar had killed the Sheltons, but had no evidence to charge him with their murders. So Tim Parlin would prove to be an easier target for prosecutors. Parlin admitted he drove Gant and Alcazar to both murder scenes, and the car Parlin was driving had Kathy Blair's blood in it. Oh, he did much more than sit in the car. He's the one who targeted Kathy. He's the one, for whatever reason, said, hey, you know what, this would be a good person for you to murder. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Parlin's lawyer, Keith Lowerman, argues that despite his client having confessed to driving Gant and Alcazar to both murders, there is no evidence placing Parlin inside the two houses. He never set foot in either one of these houses. And at the very end, you're going to realize that this man and those hands never participated in any murders. After a nine-day trial, the jury doesn't take long to reach a verdict. We the jury find the defendant, Timothy Parley, guilty of the offense of capital murder. Guilty. Parlin is sentenced to mandatory life in prison without the possibility of parole for his role in the murders of Kathy Blair and Sidney and Billy Shelton. Five months later, Gamp and Elkazar went to trial a second time for the murder of Kathy Blair. The nerves were mm -hmm. much higher the second round. Well, there's a lot at stake. There's a, a lot. lot at stake. Uh, the vehicle parked on the side of the street that it wasn't in front of a house. Again, Rob Leaf's testimony is critical for the prosecution. And uh, that at some point, did you see an individual get out of that car? Yes, sir, I did. I want you to watch this. It was a struggle, and I stabbed her in the neck. I, I didn't Look what he does with his hands. He's retrieving a memory, right? Involuntarily, he's doing this. He remembers doing because he's the one who murdered her. The police wouldn't let me go, is my understanding. Once more, Gamp and Elkazar swears the cops coerced his confession. And I come out of the bathroom. They keep saying, oh, we, we know you did it. There's no doubt you did it. And they keep saying it, keep saying it. And I just got worn down. This time out, the jury deliberates less than three hours. We, the jury, find the defendant, Sean Gant Ben Alcazar, guilty of the offense of capital murder. We poured our emotions out into this case. It was justice delayed and. Yeah, but delivered, but delivered. Like Tim Parlin before him, Sean Gamp and Elkazar was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. We're pleased. Um, we miss Kathy. This isn't going to bring her back. 
our hearts are never going to completely heal. A few months after the verdict, I spoke with Gant Benelkazar via a prison video phone. I wanted to ask why. Why would a guy who'd never been in trouble with the law suddenly turn into a vicious killer? Instead, with no evidence of any remorse, he repeated what he told the jury, that he was innocent, the cops had forced him to confess, and that Tim Parlin was the one who had killed Kathy Blair. When I went to go see him at 4, 4 a.m., um, he said, well, we're going to go get breakfast, and uh, drove me out to the place, and then said that he had killed her and told me about it. Tim Parling confessed to you that he killed Kathy Blair. Yeah, that's right. How could you have known the movements of the killer? Anything that um, I said was something that either, uh, you know, Tim told me or I just made up. And not surprisingly, when I visited Parlin at a prison in Northeast Texas. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? He yeah, pointed the finger at Camp Benelkazar and claimed he knew absolutely nothing about the murder of Kathy Blair. After Sean viciously kills Kathy Blair, gets back mm -hmm. in your car and drives away, and he goes back to Galveston. He never said a thing. Never said a thing. He never said a thing. He's a stone back. cold individual, actually. That, right. Okay. You've been described as the master manipulator, <laughs> that you talked him into doing it. My uh, IQ is very low. And oh, I have I a big heart. That. I, I have believe a, that. It is. It's very low, actually. And I have a big heart, so I'm not the mastermind behind anything. You're so. just a big teddy bear behind bars? Yeah, pretty much. Rob Leaf is the accidental hero of this story, someone who never knew he'd be called upon to help solve a murder. And you ended up leaving the neighborhood. I did. Needed a change. I did, absolutely. I would not be where I am as a, a professional actor and musician without her influence. Kathy Blair's student, Kristen DeGroote, is moving to New York to pursue her dream of a career in music. One of my greatest regrets is that I never was able to tell her that she did this for me. How proud do you think she would be of you? <laughs> I, I hope she'd be really proud of me. They're just evil people. In the end, there's just two just broken human beings who, you know, basically put a path of destruction through, you know, two families. Two families who will forever share the same tragedy. They were the best parents you could ever want. just miss her and at the end of the day she's gone and I can't call her tonight what do you think really happened watch more of Maureen's interviews with the two convicts at 48hours.com this is terrifying this is a senseless murder this is not a minor point this is really a whodunit. This is a heavy gun. This is hate. This is real. This is crazy. This is the moment of truth. This is terrifying. This is exactly what I tried to stop. CBS News. Original reporting. I met Vicki in high school. It was like we were just meant to be. We had so much in common. That was my favorite song, and to this day, I'll crank it up in the car if I hear it. It just says something about, I guess, kind of like the way I thought of her, maybe. There was never, never a doubt in my mind how much my mom and my dad loved us. My name is Bill Wagerly. I was coming home for lunch. I was working on that side of town. I figured, well, I'd hurry and get home for lunch. I found Brandon by himself, I thought. That was unusual for her not to be there with him. 
I kind of looked around, I think, for her and didn't find her. In normal life, you don't expect something bad to be happening. She died by strangulation. There were a number of uh, ligature marks around her neck. Why? Why her? You know, what did, what did she do? What did we do? He's there for 50 minutes probably before he discovers the body. There were definitely police officers that thought that Bill Wegerly killed his wife. Could that person be involved? You know, who else would have killed the wife? Did they ask you to take a polygraph? Yeah, I took a polygraph for them, and I also took one privately. And did that make them less suspicious? No, it made them more suspicious. Why? I failed both of them. So Bill Wegerly, for 18 years, had to live under the cloud of suspicion that he killed his wife? I don't think they put two and two together that this had anything to do with a serial killer. This is BTK. This is him. He killed my mom. Out of the shadows. For three decades, Wichita, Kansas has lived with a murder mystery. Ten victims strangled without mercy and a faceless killer who called himself BTK. I dealt with very, very cold-blooded killers, but none who have such a tremendous memory over this many years. I've never dealt with anybody like this. Hello, everybody. District Attorney Nola Folston eight, is prosecuting Dennis Rader, the man behind the initials, which stand for bind, torture, and kill. We have torture devices. He commented to me at one point, I'm sorry, I know this is a human being, but I'm a monster. You'll learn how Rader became that killer and the untold story of one family's horrific encounter with BTK. Bill Wegerly was victimized and tortured in this whole episode from the day that his wife died. The day that she was killed, it not only killed him, it put him under suspicion for a long period of time. Bill Wegerly and his children have been silent about what happened to them for 19 years. They speak for the first time. I remember seeing her across the hallway in school and just thinking, you know, wow. Bill met his wife, Vicki, when they were 16. She was just tall and slender and attractive, well-kept. I mean, she was quiet. And you got married when? When we were 17. Young? Yeah. Sometimes it seemed like they were just, you know, two kids in love. When they were just 18, Bill and Vicki had a daughter, Stephanie. What do you remember of your mom? To me, it seemed like she was always happy and bubbly and, you know, easy going and life was, life was good. Eight years later, a son, Brandon, was born. My life revolved around her and, and her life revolved around the kids and me and her family too. Those were the important things to us. Then came a day so surreal that even 19 years later, Bill Wegerly still seems in shock. When was the last time you saw Vicki? Uh, when I left for work that morning, probably about 8 o'clock. The date, September 16th, 1986. And I just remember kissing her goodbye, which normally I didn't take the time to do that, but that morning I did. While Bill was at work and Stephanie at school, Vicki was home. At one point that morning, she was heard playing the piano. She was also taking care of Brandon, who was then two. I was coming home for lunch and just to see her and Brandon. I passed my car on my way home. Did you know it was your car? Yeah, I was sure it was my car. And could you see who was driving it? I saw a person driving it, yes. But not your wife? No. What happened when you got home? 
Uh, I found Brandon sitting on the floor by himself. Were you worried at that moment? I was concerned, yeah. I, I didn't know exactly what was going on, why, why Brandon would be there by himself. That, that's very unusual. What did you do at that point? I eventually went into the bedroom and discovered her on the floor. Vicki had been tied up and strangled. Then you start to put things together that the person that was in my car probably, I'm sure, did this, and, and I immediately called 911. But when police arrived and started putting things together themselves, they came to a different conclusion. Did they believe you? I, I don't think they did. That's because Bill failed those two lie detector tests. The individual that I hired to take the polygraph, he said he believed what I was saying was true. He said it's just the stress that I was under. Did you think it was possible you might be charged? It got to a point, yeah, I, I was fearful of that. Police never had enough evidence to actually charge Bill or anyone else, but the rumors persisted for years. I remember going back to school and my, my friends would tell me on the playground that, you know, my mom and dad said that your dad did it. That was tough, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? I didn't say anything. We knew what the truth was, so it just made me more aware of who I was friends with. What about you, Brandon? Yeah, I had a, a teacher, I think, in middle school that had laid to her younger son who had told me that uh, me and my dad were bad people and to stay away from us. Why? Because my dad killed my mother. As you two got older, did you wonder what had happened to your mom? Yeah. What would you think? Well, I, I can remember from probably age seven or eight, my grandma told me that she thought it was BTK. But at that age, you know, that meant nothing to me, so. BTK, those initials and this symbol haunted Wichita, representing a phantom killer who had never been caught. Although it had been nine years since his last known murder, Vicki's brutal death seemed to carry his trademark. She had been bound and strangled, like all the others before her. January 1974, four members of the Otero family are tied up and strangled, including two children, nine-year-old Joseph and 11-year-old Josephine, who is hanged from a basement pipe. April 1974, 21-year-old Catherine Bright, tied up, strangled, and stabbed to death. October 1974, in a note left at the Wichita Public Library, the killer took credit for the Otero murders and gave himself a name, BTK, for bind them, torture them, kill them. March 1977, another strangling, and this time, a witness, six-year-old Steve Ralford. What do you remember that day? I remember everything. Steve was walking home from the store with soup for his sick mother, when he was confronted by a stranger. He stops me, approaches me, shows me a picture, asks me did I know who it was. I said, no, sir, I don't know who this is. Steve ran home, but moments later, there was a knock on the door. Me and my brother rushed to the door. I beat my brother. I left the BTK in my house. BTK gave Steve and his two siblings a blanket and some toys. Then he locked them in the bathroom. The terrified children watched through a crack at the top of the door as their mother, Shirley Vian, was tied to her bed and strangled. What do you remember of him? Was he tall? Ma'am, I don't remember how tall. I don't remember how short. But I remember what his face looked like. It sounds like you feel guilt that you ever let him in your house? That'll be for the rest of my life. How could you feel guilty about it, Steve? You didn't have anything to do with this. Yeah, I did. I answered the door. December 1977, BTK bound and strangled 25-year-old Nancy Fox and added a twist. He reported the murder to police himself. Yes, 
Jim. You will find a homeless side at 843 South Pershing. Nancy Fox. Then the killer sent a chilling letter to a local TV station that read in part, how many do I have to kill before I get a name in the paper or some national attention? He apparently was pretty irritated by the lack of news coverage. Former Wichita police detective Arlen Smith says the city was in a panic. We worked it with a sense of urgency because nobody knew how long it was going to be before he killed somebody else. But then, in 1979, BTK seemed to disappear. So when Vicki Weggerly was killed seven years later, police focused on the most logical suspect, her husband. I knew there was an individual out there that did this, but to me, it just seemed like they weren't looking for anybody else. All the, the pain and the heartache and just miss her. What do you miss about her? Everything. <clears throat> I mean, even, even at 10 years old, you know, she was my best friend. I don't think people understand that the difficulties that I had and the fears of just raising two kids. It was like Stephanie was my second mother. She, she stepped in and kind of took over. The Weggerly children not only lost their mother, Vicki, they also had to endure the whispers and rumors about their father for 18 years. Was there ever a time, Stephanie, that you thought your dad might have been responsible for oh, your mom's death? Oh, no, <laughs> absolutely not, never. There's a kind of a cloud that rests over your head and, oh, there's Bill Weggerly, his wife was killed and Nobody's ever found the killer. Hmm. And then on a March day in 2004, everything changed. It started with a letter to reporter Herr Slaviana. This is a copy of the envelope. Inside the envelope, a copy of Vicki Weggerly's driver's license and what appeared to be crime scene pictures of her body. I looked at the crime scene photographs and realized they weren't routine crime scene photographs. They weren't routine because police didn't take them. The only person who could have was the killer. We do not have photographs of her at the scene because she was transported because it came in as a medical call. So EMS gets there, transports her out before police have arrived. Uh, she For Lieutenant Ken Landwehr, who ran the BTK task force, the letter was a huge breakthrough. After 18 years, it cleared Bill Weggerly and exposed BTK as the real killer. This monster come into my home and took my wife from me. You know, took my life, our whole lives away from us as we knew it and, and changed us as people for the rest of our lives. For the Weggerlies and all the families that lost loved ones to BTK, the horror came rushing back. We had gone on, you know, with our lives all these years, and then to have all of it come up again and to have to live through it all again was pretty hard. The return of BTK also shocked Wichita's district attorney, Nola Folston. Like everyone else in town, her life and career had been haunted by the faceless killer. I was the same as anybody else with locking my doors, checking my phone, living in the same fear that everyone else was living with. Good evening, a new letter and new clues possibly from- Vicki Weggerly's driver's license was only the beginning. Throughout 2004, there was a frenzy of chilling BTK communiques as the killer scattered clues from past crimes all over the city, teasing, puzzling, and frightening. KFDI. The FBI is now checking out a package that was found in a Wichita park. There were doll grams, little dolls, one with a noose around its neck. The killer posed the doll to represent the murder of 11-year-old Josephine Otero, who was hanged. 
he's perverted, he's a sexual offender, he is a pedophile. There were serial boxes, BTK's sick play on the words serial killer. He's got to be really twisted to have to manufacture these pictures. He is sexually benefiting as he's drawing this stuff. Sure. Why would he reappear after years of silence? OK, are you ready? Police believe it was because of a writer named Bob Beatty. Hi. Excellent book. And the publicity surrounding his new book about the murders. This guy always wrote because he wanted attention. He writes to a television station says, how many do I have to kill before I get some attention? Soon enough, the killer, seemingly jealous of Beatty, submitted his own book to police. And then he made a mistake. Inside another cereal box, he sent a note asking if he could send police a computer disk and still stay anonymous. So he wrote and he said, be honest with me. His words, be honest with me. If I send you a disc, will it be traceable? You know, put it in the newspaper, it'll be okay, Rex, and send it under this code number. Police placed an ad in the paper, just as BTK instructed. He, in turn, sent in a disc and was trapped. When it reached its destination, immediately it was forensically examined. In no time, computer experts traced the disc to a local church and a user named Dennis. A Google search did the rest, turning up a Dennis Rader, president of the Christ Lutheran Church. And I looked at this picture and I, had, I, went, I went, you have got to be kidding me. The ghost who had terrified Wichita for 30 years finally had a face, and what a face it was. BTK was, of all things, a dog catcher, a suburban family man with two grown kids and a tidy little house. It all seemed so normal. And then it was kind of like, oh yeah, he fits. He just fits. He fits the profile. He's every man. Everyone's gut said Dennis Rader, but police wanted the case airtight. <laughs> They wanted DNA. They secretly obtained a sample from Raider's daughter. It was taken while she was in college and... Blood? No, um, pap smear. The daughter's DNA was compared to semen left at some of BTK's crime scenes. And it was a close match. On February 25th, three decades after the BTK murders began, it all ended. One of the most notorious murderers in American history was arrested in the most routine way as he headed home for lunch. It was so emotional. I can't, I can't tell you how emotional it was. It was so great. It was like, this son of a bitch is gone. He is out of here. This is BTK, and your job is to get a confession from him. He needs to say what he did. Wichita Police Lieutenant Ken Lamware spent his entire career preparing for this one moment, confronting the man he believed to be the serial killer, BTK. I wanted to clear all the homicides. I just didn't want to clear two or three. I wanted all of them. As Lamware sat down to interrogate Dennis Rader, District Attorney Nola Folston watched from the next room. What was your first reaction? I thought he was a geek. I know that sounds terrible, but he was just, he was so full of himself. For the first few hours, Raider admitted nothing. Then Lamware took him by surprise and told Raider there was DNA evidence connecting him to six of the murders, including Vicki Weggerly's. Raider's skin was found under her fingernails. Then it was like the dam had broken. You could not shut this guy up. What was the most surprising part of the confession? To the one that, that I will never forget is the fact of when he asked me the question, Ken, why did you lie to me? Did you lie to me? 
And what's he talking about when he asks you why he's did you He's looking at the floppy disk. He didn't think we could trace a floppy disk because he asked me that. Why'd you lie to me? If you wouldn't have lied to me, I wouldn't have sent it to you. Because I was trying to catch you. And when I told him I was trying to catch you, he says, but we had such a good thing going. You and I had that rapport. He really thought that they would be honest with him? Can you believe that? It could have sold him the Brooklyn Bridge. From that point on, Raider eagerly spent the next 30 hours reviewing the last 30 years of his life. As he proudly confessed to murder after murder, Raider revealed a darker nature than anyone could have imagined. It's nauseating. He'd start going on and on and on about each and every one of his conquests. While Raider was confessing, investigators began turning up physical evidence against him. In his city hall office, they discovered in plain sight a cabinet full of souvenirs from the killings, all neatly filed away. Raider called the stash his mother load. He had all the original communications. He had all the evidence, all the trinkets, driver's licenses. All those things were all very neatly stored, all in binders. Inside Raider's tiny 900 square foot house, investigators found another stash, a container in his closet full of what Raider called slick ads, sexual fantasy cards he made using magazine photos of women and young girls. What is wrong with this guy? His mind was totally fantasy driven. Police theorize these fantasies allowed Raider to go years without killing and were key to his elaborate double life a life in which the normal activities of Dennis Rader fed the ghoulish appetites of BTK. For instance, he told police he used a former job installing burglar alarms to enter homes and troll for victims. You always felt like uh, he was very busy and, you know, whatever you got, just whatever you need, let him know because he's got things to do. Very busy man. Denise Maddox shared an office with Raider at the home security company ADT in the 1980s. Vicki Weggerly was killed in the middle of the day when he was working at ADT and when you were working with him. <sighs> Which means he had to leave in the middle of the day and then come back after killing a woman and brutally killing a woman. When Raider admitted to the 1985 strangling of Maureen Hedge, a woman who lived on his own block, he told police he took the body to his church where he posed and photographed it. It was the same church where he appeared to be so devout he was elected president of the congregation. We just couldn't believe that they were talking about the Dennis Raider that we knew. Paul Carlstad has known Dennis Rader for 30 years. The Dennis that came to church every Sunday, the Dennis that was, was there to help in whatever way we wanted him to help. It, it, just didn't, it just didn't make any sense. Rader also revealed that he slipped away from a Boy Scout camping trip in 1991 to strangle 62-year-old Dolores Davis. It was Rader's last murder. His fantasy is to take her to a barn, string her up, and then do some sexual bondage things with this dead body and photograph her. But Raider got caught in a snowstorm and dumped the body under a bridge instead. And it isn't until a couple of weeks later that her body's actually located underneath this bridge uh, out in the county. And they find with it a mask, a plastic mask that's been painted decorated with some eyelashes and lipstick and painted face on it. What made him think he had the right to take somebody that meant the world to me? So unjust. For Dolores Davis's son, Jeff, learning the identity of his mother's killer is a fresh outrage. What sick, perverted pleasure can you possibly get enjoying looking into somebody's terrified eyes as you strangle the life out of them? 
the BTK suspect will be back in court in about a half an hour. A court proceeding is scheduled at 9 o'clock. Finally, Raider was forced to appear in public for the first time since his arrest. Sir, I have been advised it is your desire to enter a plea of guilty in this case. Is that correct? Yes, sir. On June 27th, in a Wichita courtroom, he pleaded guilty to all 10 murders. I used a ruse as a uh, telephone repairman to get in their house. Raider's casual, cooperative tone in the courtroom seemed strangely at odds with the brutal murders he described. I was still kind of in a fog, I think. You know, it just didn't seem real that this person could do these things. And then for me, it really hit home when he said he walked on up to the door and heard the piano. Uh, as I approached it, I could hear a piano sound. That's when I knew that, you know, yeah, that was my mom that he heard playing. Is that the first time you realized this really was the killer? Mm -hmm. But even as he was admitting what he did, Dennis Rader failed to answer the biggest question of all. What made him do it? I remember one of the detectives saying, uh, the devil comes in an angel's disguise. still doesn't seem, it still doesn't seem 100% real to me. Why not? That this normal look, you know, normal average guy that's married, has two kids, does all the normal stuff, that, that he could do such horrible things to so many innocent people. We know Dennis Rader did do these horrible things. The only question is why? I was able to speak with him by phone, and I met with him twice in jail. Cameras, however, were banned. This is what Raider told me. He says he grew up like any other child in a loving family and insists he was never abused. In fact, Raider's court-appointed attorney, Steve Osborne, admits he tried to find something, anything from Dennis Raider's past that could somehow explain BTK. We talked to the family some, and you know, we didn't see anything that jumped out at us as abnormal. Um, no trauma, no big event that would scar him or, or, or cause, you know, something like this to happen. Yet, as young as seven or eight years of age, Raider told me and investigators, he became fascinated with inflicting pain on living things. He started with animals. As a young boy, he first became aroused when he was at his grandparents' farm and they would um, uh, kill chickens for, um, for feeding the family. And he became very fixated on the death of those animals. And it gets stranger. While other boys of his generation looked up to baseball players, Raider says his hero was Harvey Glattman, a serial killer who targeted young single women in Hollywood. He was executed in 1959 when Raider was just 14, but Glattman became an inspiration for the boy who would grow up to terrorize Wichita. Remember Annette Funicello? Raider told detectives, quote, she was my favorite fantasy hit target when she was on the Mouseketeers. Raider imagined how he would kidnap the star Mouseketeer and, quote, do sexual things to her in California. Raider told me that as he got older, he collected detective pulp magazines depicting women in bondage, that the act of tying up a human body became an obsession an obsession that he managed to keep secret from everyone he knew, even when he began killing at the age of 29. For all these years, he seemed just like anybody else here. He might have been someone you talked to, you might have been standing next to him here in the library. Right, right. This is Author Robert Beatty. Uh, they were looking for crazy Charles Manson, somebody with a history of crime, sex crimes, uh, mental disorders. You get on the elevator with Charles Manson, you're going to move the other side of the elevator. So you get on the elevator with BTK, you're going to smile and nod and have a conversation. You're never going to suspect this guy. I trusted this man. 
I mean, I really trusted him. During the time that Denise Maddox shared an office with Raider at ADT, you will find a homicide. That 14 second phone call reporting Nancy Fox's homicide was replayed repeatedly on television. Denise, you worked with him for 11 years. I did. And you didn't recognize his voice on that I didn't. phone. Mm -mm. Mr. Rager, would you please stand with counsel? She also never connected the killer's behavior with a Dennis Rader she knew. Sure he was polite and guard. even protective of women. I was working around all these guys, sharing a restroom with them. I was the only woman, and he always wanted to make sure that they put the lid down and no dirty jokes. He painted the bathroom for me because I thought it was a, it was really gross. Well, no, I mean, they were. They thought, well, we know from Raider's own letters to police that he admired famous murderers like Jack the Ripper and Son of Sam. But what isn't widely known is how much he borrowed from his hero serial killer. Harvey Glattman, a warning. What you are about to see may be very disturbing. Back in the 1950s, Glattman's victims were beautiful young models. He would lure them with the promise of a photo shoot. Glattman bound, gagged, and then photographed them in the moments before he strangled them. Rader told me that's where he got the idea. These are the pictures Dennis Rader took, this of his last killing. He shows her laying on the bed, gagged. Rader even sketched a drawing of that same victim. It was with her eyes open and a very horrified look on her face and actually reinforcing that uh, she knew of her impending death. Raider is proud to take credit for all of this, but what he didn't want the public to know was how far he took his obsession with bondage. This is Raider. He took these photographs of himself, this one in an open grave he dug for a victim. Dennis Raider did not want that evidence to come out. He did not want people to see him in a negative light. He wanted people to see him as some gentleman serial killer. We believed that that was totally inappropriate. The killing, the stalking, the fantasy world. Somehow, Raider managed to hide it all, even from the woman who thought she knew him best, his wife of 33 years, Paula Raider, a bookkeeper. They appeared to be a devoted couple, regularly attending church together. Is it possible that his wife, who lived with him for all those years, truly had no idea he was connected to this? I'm convinced of it, yeah. What makes you say that? I've talked to that woman. That woman, just to be honest, is a very, very nice woman, a saint. She is totally devastated. I've talked to his daughter, a wonderful, wonderful young woman, totally devastated by the actions of this man. They had no idea. How would his wife not have any idea that she was living with a serial killer. In a 30-year period, he disappeared for 10 nights in a 30-year period, probably less than a lot of men in America. But he hid so much stuff in the house. And you she know, he was pretty neat. He, uh, he, had, he kept it neat, he kept it orderly. A lot of his stuff was at his, his workplace. And he's such a control freak. Maybe that's the relationship he had with his wife. Don't be touching my things. Why didn't Raider target his wife? He looked shocked when I asked him that question. He said he didn't kill anyone he knew, that his victims were just objects. He did say, however, that his wife was terrified of BTK and that he once reassured her by telling her to keep all the windows and doors locked. I wasn't really worried, he told me, since I knew I was the one doing all the killing. I'll take care of that Steve for you. Osborne believes that even if no one had discovered his well-kept secret, Dennis Rader, dog catcher, scout leader, church president, was planning to one day take credit for becoming BTK. I think this was his life's work and he wanted basically to take a bow for it. I mean, this, this is who he was, this is what he did. I don't think that he was gonna go to the grave without taking a bow for this. What do you hope happens to Dennis Rader at this point? I hope he's incarcerated for the rest of his life, which he will be, and that we never have to hear from him again.
it is some person within our community suffering from a mentality disorder leading toward the fetish. For those in Wichita who lived through three decades of fear and grief. It's like a war has ended and there's not really a victory, but the war's over. Today is a day they never thought they'd see. Dennis Rader is about to be sentenced for his crimes. I can see it in his eyes and his face. This guy's an animal and he's a monster. To make sure Rader is put in prison for life, the state must present evidence of his killings. After we had heard what she had went through, I know for me that's when I decided that I could be strong enough for her to sit through everything that I had to to get to the end of it. That's the least I could do for her. For Stephen Ralford, it is a memory he has tried so hard to forget. I see the same thing all my life. My mom laying there on that bed, me looking over that door. Until now, this is the only way Steve Ralford could release the anger and grief he has known since his mother was killed by Raider in 1977. Will it be over after the sentencing for you? No, it will never, never be over, ma'am. Never, until this son of a bitch is dead. My mom was my life, and he took it from me. satisfying for you at any point. Are you guys still in this morning? With the sentencing about to begin, Ralford and the other families arrived to finally confront the man who caused them all so much pain. Now, I've waited 14 years. I want him to hear my statement. I want him to hear what I have to say. District Attorney Nola Folston hopes to expose the real man behind the killer who was invisible and once seemed invincible. This is a man who is twisted and the community needed to see that. All right. Thank you, please be seated. <coughs> it is a day and a half of mind-numbing testimony. He strangled her by tying the rope tightly around her neck, put a plastic bag over her head. Did Mrs. Davis put up any resistance <clears throat> or fight? There was nothing that she could do. He stated that it took approximately two to three minutes for her, and she felt no more pain. Finally. My name is Charlie Otero. My name is Beverly Platt. The families get their chance to speak. I want him to suffer as much as he made his victims suffer. Although we have never met, you have seen my face before. It is the same face you murdered over 30 years ago. The face of my mother, Julie Otero. For the last 5,326 days, I have wondered what it would be like to confront the walking cesspool that took my mother's precious life. If I had your devil nature, I would delight in the fact that your congregation has turned its back on you, that your wife has divorced you, that your own children have disowned you. You have now lost everything, and you will forever remain nothing. Thank you, Your Honor. My name's Steve Relford. Shirley Vianne was my mother. After waiting 28 years for this moment. I'd just like for him to suffer for the rest of his life. Words fail Steve Ralford. And, you know, I don't, uh, that's all. Your Honor, uh, my name is Bill Wakerly. <laughs> Bill Wakerly, too, is overwhelmed as his daughter speaks from her broken heart. It's been almost 19 years now that my brother and I had the most important woman in our lives taken from us. It's not fair that we had so little time with her. It's not fair that she doesn't get to see me with her grandchildren. My mother begged for her life, yet he showed no remorse. If the families hoped to see that remorse from Dennis Rader today, they didn't get it. 
Some of them weren't even willing to sit and hear him speak and simply walked out. Can you hear Okay. Uh, I know the uh, victim's families will never be able to forgive me. Uh, I hope somewhere deep down, eventually, that will happen. When he finally apologizes... A final apologize to the victim's families. There's no way that I can ever repay him. His closing words ring hollow. It's pitiable for Mr. Rader to stand here looking all pale and pasty and say how sorry he is. You know, gosh, I'm really sorry. Well, what else do you say after you kill 10 people? At the time of the murders, Kansas had no death penalty. You, Dennis L. Rader, be taken by the sheriff of Sedgwick County. So the judge gave Rader the maximum sentence, 175 years. They're coming down the road. They're now on prison property. And if the families get their way, Dennis Rader and BTK will just fade into the past. I hope that people will not correspond with him, have anything to do with him. That would probably be a greater suffering to him than if he was put to death or tortured or whatever else.